I'm here today with Simon Chinnery of JP Morgan Asset Management and we're going to talk about one of our favourite topics, if not everybody's favourite topic, pensions. Now Simon, there's been an awful lot of change in the pensions environment <laughs> recently. What do you think have been the changes that have been uh, so the most relevant to our readers and also maybe the most exciting? Well, I think a couple of a couple of things. One would be auto enrolment, which is uh, well underway now, um, and the other one would be, I, I think, the changes that we saw from the budget last year, yeah. um, freedom and choice, and the the what we've seen it, early stages at the moment. What we've seen so far is a lot fewer people buying annuities or wanting mm. to buy annuities and so people thinking about what they do want to do with their money, how they want to spend it um, and that's brought up a lot of debate in around the retirement uh, around the retirement arena which perhaps perhaps before nobody really bothered about because everyone went off and bought an annuity. Yeah, but interestingly even before these changes in the budget you didn't have to buy an annuity did you? You could go, you could go into drawdown, uh, not flexible drawdown, capped drawdown if you didn't have a huge amount of money so even in the past there was the option for people to go non-annuity but yeah. really people just didn't. Well, I, I guess I, I guess the, the, a lot of people didn't because they couldn't because actually they didn't have enough money. But it, it, I suspect that you know the rarefied air of people who went and bought drawdown is now an expanded universe. So lots more people can think about what they might want to do with their money. And at the moment, drawdown. Well, how much money do you need to, for drawdown? Well, I guess a comparator would be to say at the moment, if I if I put a hundred thousand into an annuity. What's that going to give me on, a, on an annual, maybe, I don't know, £5,000? That kind of doesn't feel like a very good deal. So I think people are saying, well, actually, if I've got £100,000, how might I be able to improve on that? Hmm. And, but uh, £5,000 doesn't sound bad. That's, that's 5%. That seems reasonably yeah. high, given the interest rate environment. I mean, you'd be, you'd be hard pushed to make 5% yourself of £100,000 safely. Yeah, and, and, but I think the other thing that is beginning to surface is people thinking about not only what they're going to do in retirement, but how long they might <laughs> be in retirement. Mm. And, and, and as I'm sure you know, I mean, the people may well be living, I don't know, mid 80s and mm. beyond. And therefore, ha what, you know, that's a long, a long time not earning. So I think the other thing that, that's of interest now is that people, you know, in the old defined benefit world, they got, they got to retirement and then they went off and played golf or whatever they did. Now, of course, people are thinking about maybe they want to work a bit longer, they want to go part time, you know, they want to keep busy in different ways, um, paid or unpaid. Mm -hmm. So I think now the whole, the, that whole world is a lot more fluid and, and therefore people may want mo to spend money in different ways. Okay. I mean, the, one of the big challenges is that the, what is happening now is probably not that representative for the future because I think at the moment people are mainly retiring with defined benefit guarantees in place. To Mainly, a greater, do you really think so? To a greater or less extent, I, I think they'll have some kind of underpin. It yeah. may not be a, a great amount, but, but it'll maybe they'll have, have a pension bills. from their first job in their twenties yep. or thirties, or maybe their forties, yep. which is giving them a, yep. a low level of defined benefit, and then yes. they're putting their, their DC on top of that. Yeah, and and you know maybe these are people who've also saved in ISIS for a number of years. Um, they may have moved into a couple, two or three job changes, which have had DC pots. So they may kind of view the DC pots as you know, money that they can access easily. But, uh, but I suppose the interest from our side is to look at how that may change quite quickly because once that DB guarantee wedge has sort of died out and maybe that happens in 10 years or so. It happens very soon, doesn't it? I mean, I, I obviously, not obviously, but I don't have a DB pension and right, most people no. my age don't no. have a DB pension, no. but I have a lot of friends who are maybe only four or five yeah. years older than me who do. Uh, yeah. which I find exceptionally irritating. Yeah. But it, but it right. suggests yeah. that, that the gap isn't, isn't that far. It'll yeah. be 10 years and, yeah. and the DB pension thing will be pretty much gone. Absolutely. And, and then, you know, the question would be, what are those, pe have those people uh, saved sufficiently? Um, particularly if, if they're actually thinking about what they're going to be doing, which, you know, who knows what they'll be doing when they want to retire. But, but it's likely they're going to be working for longer. Mm. Um, so, you know, I think that the savings challenge now is, is not so much about the people and what they're doing now, whether they're taking cash, how they're spending it, but actually what people might want um, in, in terms of savings vehicles and, and what they might want to do in retirement. Yeah. Well, there's really there's two challenges here, aren't there? There's, uh, I mean, your industry is the fund management industry and the wealth management, very geared to accumulation. Yeah. The idea being that you help people get the money together, uh, give them vehicles into which they can save. Mm -hmm. And the point of the industry up until now has been to help people save the maximum possible until the retirement date. 
yeah. to shift their assets around the place so they move into lower risk products or lower risk asset classes as they hit their retirement date. And then post retirement date, it's not your problem anymore because yeah. they've gone yeah. off and bought an annuity. Correct. So now we still have this accumulation problem, yeah. although it's a slightly different problem to the one it used to be. But then for an industry, you have a whole new area which should, yeah. be, should be very exciting for you, yeah. which is helping people through the yeah. decumulation stage, yeah. helping them run their money down over their retirement uh, help, help so that it lasts, yeah. but, but also provides them yeah. with the lifestyle that they want during that yeah. decumulation period. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's an in, sort of an entirely new business it, it for is the financial business. services industry yeah. in the UK. Yeah, and it, I mean, it's a good point because I thought, you know, I, I personally I thought that the advisor market would respond um, perhaps quicker and um, with more enthusiasm about this new um, mass market, uh, mass affluent, whatever you want to call it. But m my sense is that they're still very much focused on, you know, the large sort of directors, executive uh, end up the SIP market, the self-investment personal pension area where, you know, 200, 300,000 pounds is the kind of engagement point for yeah. them. I think that over time, what we're going to see, especially if DC pots are consolidated, that you know, over a relatively short period of time, there will be a mass market of people who've got, you know, I don't know, fifty, sixty thousand, a hundred thousand saved, and they don't want to buy an annuity, and they probably are not going to get advice. They mm -hmm. don't want advice, um, and and so what are those people going to do? Um, and I think that's kind of the challenge for us in the industry to imagine something which is good enough and simple enough and and you know transparent enough to be able to be used probably as an alternative to a bank account mm, exactly well let's take this in two stages mm -hmm. really let's look at the accumulation mm -hmm. stage first sure. because the way that one saves for retirement now changes slightly because if yeah. you're not building up to it in the past people yeah. who've, been, who've been saving for retirement have been building up to one thing one date yeah. um, at when they want to have the maximum cash possible yeah. or the maximum low risk asset possible yeah. so that they can then buy the best annuity they possibly mm -hmm. can. Yeah. And this is over time, this has involved people having equities or similar high risk or assets that we consider to be high risk at yeah. the beginning of their saving career, moving into the bond market towards the end of their savings career because that's what the industry considers to be low risk. I think they're wrong by the way, but that's another argument. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I agree is, with that. Yeah, and yeah. this is known yeah. as, has always been known as yeah. lifestyle. Yeah. So you go yeah. equity into bond yeah. and then on the, the day of your retirement, you You've got a portfolio that is basically all bonds and cash. Buy an um, you buy an annuity, yeah. boom, it's done. Yep. Now, we don't have that anymore. No one's building up to this one date. It, yeah. you know, they're going to draw this money yeah. down or need this money at any any large number of dates from yeah. age 55 yep. on. Yep. So that means that the, the mix of assets that you save in in the run-up to, to your retirement, whenever that may be, it's very different. Yes, I think you know we we've come uh, we've come the way we have in terms of life si lifestyle life cycle, and and I think that was very much a set and forget. I think it was pretty pretty simplistic in the sense that it was just as you say, put them in equities when they're younger. Um, you know they'll they get good growth from that over time. But the assumption, of course, was you're going to get returns of maybe between eight and ten percent per annum, and then possibly in the last five seven years or so you glide them or, or, or change them glide down. them yeah this is a great phrase the glide yeah. path people always talk about it in, well, in, in it, your business it, about it, gliding you gliding over as from, if it's, from it, it's like a to low swan. risk yeah. there, it was yeah. easy as though yeah. it were easy well and, and actually it is a good analogy because in fact it's not it's nothing like a swan gliding on the surface of the water it's a particularly life cycle it's a whole lot of mechanistic administrative changes and a very clunky fashion which has nothing to do with markets um, which literally took you out of these riskier assets into less risky assets in a fairly fast and furious manner after maybe five seven mm. years. Should we just um, clarify here and say that we're using risky and less risky in the sort of yes, traditional, traditional the financial and, sense of risky and not risky yeah. which which yeah. has been uh, so I mean, it, yeah. So the, the the simplistic of the equities, bonds, cash, boom, they the, you're done. I, I absolutely is not a model that's sustainable. Um, I think life cycle is absolutely broken in, t in that. I think the you know what 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 really you need is something that is going to be well diversified. It manages the money um, and manages the various risks that go through the the the, the different ages that an individual has in terms of events and terms of what happens in their life and actually then eventually goes to a point where they can take their money but even then I think it's really critical that they're not stuck in something I mean you said bonds are they uh, are they uh, you know uh, the old-fashioned less risky I completely I think now they're, they're certainly very risky mm. and, and why would you want to park somebody in that especially if they may not buy an annuity mm. so I think a multi-asset and um, if we're talking about a 30 40 year retirement 
uh, you still want to be in something that need some has risk assets. in the traditional sense, i.e. Yeah. it's going to have the chance yeah. of giving you some growth yeah. at the same time as income. Yeah. yeah. So, I, I mean, our industry is brilliant at over-engineering everything. So right now, I think the, the biggest problem that we're seeing is that uh, advisors um, are looking at these old-fashioned glide paths and, and, you know, life cycle structures and saying, I know exactly what you said, that because people need a bit more growth, but what we'll do is we'll put a diversified growth fund in there, that's a multi-asset fund, and we'll keep them more risk in, in risk assets for longer. Um, and, and even beyond that, what some of them are doing is slicing and dicing the workforce and saying, well, anybody who earns over th under 30,000, they'll probably take cash, so we'll glide them into cash. And then there's another lot, however they define that other lot, as likely to buy an annuity. So that's a different mix. So we'll have a different glide path for them. And suddenly you have this bizarre thing where you've got multiple defaults, and which is fine if you ask people what do you want to do, but most people have no idea what they well, want to do. Well, there's no point in asking someone who's 30 what they might want when they're 55. Yeah. No point in asking someone who's 45 what uh, they want to uh, when I they're agree. 55 these days. I agree. And, and, and I think that most people, let, let's remember that most people are in a default in, in, in UK DC. 80, 90 percent of members. So they have probably said, yeah, I just want to clarify, else when, you, to when you say a default, what you mean is that when people sign up for a pension with their company or whatever, there is a fund that will be the one they will go into unless they actively choose something else, and yes. that's known as the default fund. Yes. And yeah. so th this default, um, and this is where life cycle comes in and this sort of fairly simplistic design uh, of the past is is you know you you're in that fund and you're going to go and buy an annuity well suddenly these people are not but to actually ask them what they want to do it is not going to get the right result uh, mostly to actually then allocate people to these different glide paths on some basis of assumptions well you know they're all they're all likely to take cash i think it's very risky because if people decide they want to work longer you could be parked in cash for five six seven years mm. Not a, not a great place to be at the moment. Do you think that there's a risk here that these default funds become another mis-selling st scandal? In that, uh, you know, you can say that a default is not advised, but if you're creating a default based on a set of assumptions, you are effectively saying to the person, "We advise you to take this one because we've created it as your default." I think I, I think it, I think there's multiple glide paths, there's multiple defaults. If if somebody has decided for you that you are, you are likely to buy an annuity. And, and what happens, you know, we don't know the whole picture. We don't know that individual, how many other places they've got money, where how many, whether they've got a partner that has actually greater earnings. Um, we don't know the whole picture. So we would go, why, why are you getting involved in all this over-engineering with, with the possibility that 10, 15 years down the line, somebody goes, well, hold on, I've been put in this fund, I was put in this fund, and actually I ended up getting nothing for, or very little, um, for many years. And, and you know, it's likely that they, I imagine that they would want to blame somebody. Mm -hmm. um, so just parking that a moment, it seems to me that if you have a multi-asset um, fund that is actively managed um, between these different asset classes and managing these different risks, whether it's inflation or interest rate risk or the fact that you're going to insist on living longer, um, well, why wouldn't you have something which... If you want the money as cash, you just cash in the units. It's liquid. It's not. Mm -hmm. It's not rocket science. If you want an annuity, well, towards the end of the glide path, it's likely you're going to have a higher allocation to bonds. But they don't all have to be gilts. They can be long. They can be longer dated. They can be government. They're corporate bonds. A bit of high yield in their emerging market debt where appropriate. You know, so you're well diversified. The point being that that actually is more of a proxy for buying annuities now than simply the old days of you know buying over 15 year gilts. And if you wanted something that well, actually, I want an income drawdown. Um, well, you're in a multi-asset vehicle that has growth in it. Um, our own fund ends up at about 25% in equities now uh, and another 5% in real assets. Okay, so your answer to absolutely everything is multi-asset fund? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> It, it, actually, it, it's about saying for these people that don't know what they want to do, mm -hmm. then what we feel is really important is to manage a multi-asset fund, not just for the sake of it, but actually with an objective of, of a, a target income replacement, a minimum income replacement. Because if you don't, to your point earlier about saying people just want to maximize growth, that's great, but mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately it will depend on 
your timing as to when you got into whatever fund it is, and you might be in one equity fund, I'm in another. They have very different returns, and you know we're down the pub, and we're kind of one of us is feeling great because we've got a good retirement. The other's actually feeling a bit deflated. So. Our point is, why wouldn't we manage everybody on the basis of, uh, of actually trying to get them to a minimum income replacement? Um, on the basis, then actually that should help the company because the company doesn't want to be looking after these people forever either. Mm -hmm. They'd like to be, <coughs> excuse me, encourage these people to move on into retirement. Move on into what? Well, uh, yeah, and then of <laughs> course we're delighted to uh, offer things other than multi-asset, although multi-asset, funnily enough, does feature strongly in terms of income. Mm -hmm. You know, diversification, actively managed. Um, if people need income, if they need exposure to it, if they just want something that gives them I mean, a good This is an interesting profile. point. You talk about needing income. I'm confused, always, by something, but particularly mm -hmm. confused by the idea that in retirement, people talk about needing income and they don't think of capital as income. Whereas yeah. it rather seems to me that once you're yeah. into your decumulation phase into your drawdown phase, it doesn't make any difference yeah. whether what you take out is technically income or technically capital. Yeah. You know, I had a, a telephone call from a, um, a, a an elderly friend a few years ago who said to me that um, she was worried she didn't have enough money. And and I said, oh, well, you know, yeah. well, how, how, how's that working out? Mm. And she said it was because the income from her fund was so low and her advisor strongly advised against her taking any of the capital. Mm -hmm. Now, she was 87. Yeah. And yeah. Do you know yeah, what? Yeah, Spend the capital. It doesn't make any difference. <laughs> no, it's no. all money. Yeah. So, but the industry is still making yeah. this distinction yeah. for people for whom it really shouldn't matter yeah. between income and capital. Well, I, I, I think it is a great British fixation with you know what at every at, at all costs preserve the capital, um, and you know we'd agree because I think the whole it's about the utility of that money, isn't it? It's about saying. On the one hand, how, how long are you going to live, and you hopefully want to live as long as you can, and on the other, how much money can you spend in a way that gives you the most options in, in retirement, in a way that actually gives you um, a greater degree of, of return overall, and, it, and I agree with you. I mean, if you need to, if you want to allocate some money, either to, as an insurance policy to, I don't know, buy an annuity at a later date, go ahead, or if you have enough money to actually be, be able to preserve that for future generations, great. But actually, if you, if you just want to live off your money, after all, you've, you've done a lot to build it up, mm. why wouldn't you then just draw it? And, and I guess the key that we're looking at is how do you create a sustainable level of payout? No guarantees, because if you need that, you need to go and buy an annuity. But something that gives you a a good enough return, and so it's not just income, it could be capital, it would be capital So we should well. always look at things in, in terms of total returns in the decumulation yeah. phase, surely? Because I, I just think, you know, in the, the difference of your quality of life, certainly in the first, say, 10, 15 years of retirement, when, you know, supposedly you're probably more active doing a lot of different things, that wouldn't you want the difference of having an extra two or three thousand pounds that because you were able to take money that was capital as well as income in something that did look to keep the growth uh, going in terms of the capital so it didn't just say we must just scoop money off a global income fund you know it feels to me that then you've got a much better quality potential quality of living the trouble is that people feel that they get become risk averse mm. but there's a lot of evidence to say that unfortunately what happens is people actually underspend. Well, this is the thing. People don't spend enough money uh, because they're well, not they're what's enough, but uh, yeah. you know they don't but spend they, as much as they could to yeah. live a happy life because yeah. they're so terrified about running down the capital when they've probably only well, they've got that much life left, which seems always seems to me incredibly sad. Yeah. And I think no, there's I a lot the industry could do yeah. around that. Yeah. To I'm mean, an, an yeah. annuity, obviously you haven't got any capital, no. so you're not leaving any no. capital. So no. there there must be a middle way that the industry can create yep. that will allow people yeah. to feel okay about drawing down their capital yeah. with is it some insurance that they won't run out. Yeah, and, and you know, it could, it could be, I mean, it, I think it's also important to give people that flexibility that at any time you can take your money. If, you, if circumstances change, that's fine. You, know, you can have access to your money. But I think this idea that, you know, that, that just to say have income and at all costs keep that money, that capital, I agree that I think it would lead to a, a paucity of living. Yeah.
Now, on, on, that, on that very subject of people refusing to sell their, their capital, um, I wonder how you feel about the uh, removal of the, uh, the death tax on pensions mm. so that people can now effectively yeah. leave their pensions yeah. Yeah. in their entirety tax-free, inheritance tax-free and death tax-free, etc., to their children, uh, post-75 subject to mm -hmm. the children paying or the heirs paying their yeah. marginal rate of income tax. But nonetheless, this is an enormous and rather bizarre incentive yes. uh, to the retired yeah. to not spend any yes. money. Don't spend the Don't money, spend whatever money. you do. Uh, yeah. Because you can now leave yeah. it to your children yeah. IHT free, and of course this yeah. effectively creates for, for well-off families. Yeah. It creates effectively a, a family trust in perpetuity, mm. uh, and for the not so well-off, yeah. it, it creates a sort of desperation to to not spend yeah. pension money. It seems to me to be a very distortionary policy. Mm -hmm. I, I suspect most people will not have got sufficient savings, certainly in the next generation, to actually have that luxury of being able to say, you know what, there's a pension pot over there and I'm just not going to touch it. Okay, so it's just another bung for the rich. Well, your word's not mine, <laughs> but I mean, I, you know, we, we, I, I think the interesting thing out of this, uh, this change in the next decade or so will be the emergence of uh, an, uh, uh, you know, an influential um, mass affluent market of people who actually are th quite thoughtful about what they want to do. It doesn't mean they're going to do their own thing, which is probably a good thing, but, but actually are looking for solutions that give them, um, you know, give them access to their money, give them some, some comfort that that money is sustainable, that uh -huh. they're not going to, you know, outlive it. Um, but actually they can enjoy the quality of life. And, you know, I think that's the area that, you know, if we don't address that, I think our industry is quite rightly then going to be accused mm -hmm. of just pandering or looking after the sort of tax base. But listen, Simon, aren't you scared of this? A whole new generation of people who are going to be relatively well educated about their finances, who are going to be desperate to make their money last for 30, 40, 50 years, and therefore totally on top of the business of the outrageous fears the industry uh, charges them, comparing their own retirements with, with your retirement, etc. Isn't your industry frightened? And if it isn't, oh. shouldn't it be bloody terrified? Because, you know, once the, once the middle classes of England rise up against rise something, up. Yeah. they rise up. And if they rise up against yeah. the way they've been treated by the financial services industry, but, and in particular against the fees, the complicated structure, and as you say, your, your industry's um, propensity to over-engineer, um, the profit margins of the likes of JP Morgan Asset Management are in, in some danger. Well, it, I, I think that that... I mean, certainly in DC, we have a, you know, we, we built our target date funds in, a, in an environment where the regulator was very much focused on, you know, the default plans with an auto enrollment. You know, so we'd like to think they're as transparent as possible. It's very simple pricing. I actually think that it, it looks that likely that we should, we should have some kind of, it looks like there'll be some kind of price cap in, mm. in retirement. Uh, now, what that'll look like in terms of default um, and how simple that, that those measures would be, you know, it's not a bad discipline. If we are looking at a market that's going to be much bigger, mm -hmm. then then I think it, I think it's appropriate that, that we have the right kind of regulation um, overseeing it. But I think I think in terms of information, particularly if people, you know, yes, they'll they'll want to be informed, but I suspect they'll also just want to get on with being retired and having having oh, but the think best of, all of their life. Think of that spare time they'll have. Well, think of how much spare time they're retired having. And once they've started complaining about the charges on their pensions, the next thing they're going to notice the charges on their ISAs, going to notice that how much they've been paid, charged for insurance, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you, you know, know you never have time to sit down for the three, four hours a month you shouldn't look after your finances before you're retired. But after you're retired, it's not just coming in every month in annuity payments, but you've got to generate it yourself. There's a huge focus there that I hope mm. will massively improve mm the financial services industry in the UK, well, that I, pressure. I, I, you know, I, I absolutely think that, that we as an industry, and certainly JP Morgan Asset Management, what we want to do is make sure that we produce um, stuff, uh, that's a technical term, uh, that is actually going to be used and, and is transparent in terms of how it's priced, what it's going to, what it's going to deliver, what it's not going to deliver. You know, so we want people to be informed in terms of the choice because you definitely don't want somebody saying, "I'm not going to buy an annuity," but then buying something, they go, "Well, I thought it was guaranteed." Well, either that's really bad communication in terms of marketing, 
or or we or it's you know somehow been missold. And mm -hmm. I think if we are in a very in a world where we want to see people actually um, not only build up sufficient assets to be able to retire, which is a big challenge I think in the in the future, but then when they are in retirement, that they have that they have that flexibility and they can see at any time what their what their fund or funds are doing. And you know, maybe they're not going to spend hours every day worrying about it. I mean, mm. some might, but I think a lot of them want to be able to feel that they have still kind of being in a default. It's almost like a default in retirement. Mm, they don't want to engage that much. No, I, I suspect mm. not. And, and you know, they'll dip in and out and they'll want to have a look. And that maybe is where technology comes So you're not expecting in. all that pressure on your margins from a well-educated group of retirees? We have we live with pressure all the time, so you know we're 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 under the spotlight, and I think that's appropriate. And and I think, you know, we I think this is part of the next generation of defined contribution and retirement. I think a, a world in which we can actually see, you know, solutions that come up that are kind of fed back from the market, and and something that we also hear, of course, is that people want everything. They, mm. Can I have a guarantee? Can I have super growth? Can I have all my money back plus, you know, oh, and I'd like to pass it on to the next generation. Yeah. And, 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 you, and you can promise me that I'll buy you a fund and, you know, maybe we can't deliver on all those, but, but, but we should try. Mm. And, and what we can't do, we should be clear about. And, and I think it's possible, I really do, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm in this industry because I do think that we have, we have a, a, a duty of care and, uh, as kind of trustees would feel not just to people as they accumulate the money but actually how they spend it and if those people coming out to a world where they either choose choose not to get advice or they don't want advice but maybe they look to people like you and they'll say well what kind of options are out there I think it's really that you know they'll they'll just say I don't want to be drowned in choices but if there are two or three things that I should think about why wouldn't I kind of have a look through and go, okay, that one sounds appropriate. Mm. As long as I can get my money at any time, yep, I understand what I'm buying. That, that, that I don't see why we put that in the too hard box. You mentioned just now, and we haven't really elaborated on it, uh, target funds, and we were slightly talking about them earlier, but would you just explain briefly what, what that actually means? Sure, so a target date fund is, is a single fund um, managed dynamically, usually actively, um, through the whole journey of um, savings. So from, from the per first point where you go into a job, to the point where you retire. Mm -hmm. And over time, the glide path, it will move from riskier assets to less risky assets. Um, so it's, it's just a, it's a modern life cycle fund? It's, well, I, I would say there's very distinct differences. Life cycle is a selection of individual funds, mm -hmm. often made by a consultant or advisor, put in um, to a mechanistic administrative um, machinery, which will just swap you out of these funds. Okay, and this is often. just one fund that operates. This is one fund, multi-asset. I mean, our own, our own target date funds have something like 10 different asset classes at any time, something like 20 different strategies. So there's a lot of, a lot of underlying movements, so the swan gliding and underneath maybe quite okay. a lot So all the time we were talking earlier about multi-asset funds, but you're really talking about just target, target date funds. Well, target date funds, in, because we just think it's a natural evolution mm. from where we've come from, which is the old balance funds, you know, 60, 40 equity bonds, whatever it is to something where professionally it, it's being managed, managing these different risks, inflation, interest rate risk, longevity risk, event, you know, what happens in the market. So it's got to be actively managed. Um, and, it, and it's absolutely, well, in, in our case, it is focused on an income replacement target, mm. rather than just saying, we're gonna shove as much money as we can into risky assets and let's hope some of you have a great retirement. I just think that's not, not a good deal for members. Um, you know, it's not about the top 10% who can afford probably to play with money more. It's about every single member in the DC plan. And do you think that the annuity market will come back a bit from here? Because yeah. in fact, annuities are, I mean, it's be, the annuity market is really very difficult because of super low interest rates and also, you know, there has been a hefty degree of overcharging and bad advice mm -hmm. and failure to take a individuality into account when selling them, et cetera, et cetera. But nonetheless, yeah. if you ask people what they want in retirement, very often they describe something that sounds just Which like Which sounds an like annuity. an annuity until you so tell them it is an exactly. annuity. And they go, no, I don't want one of them. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. it may be that, yeah. you know, 10 years out, yeah. in fact, yeah. you know, 20, 30% of the market yeah. is 
returns to being annuities. Is that something Absolutely. you see happening? I, I, I have no doubt that, that annuities are in no way dead. Um, I think we'll see a spate of different types of annuities. Um, you know, for instance, Nest has talked about uh, that hoping that there'll be an emergence of a market around deferred annuities. Mm -hmm. I think it's quite normal that people say, well, actually, for the first 10 or 15 years, maybe I'm still doing a bit of work. I'm, I'm you know, keeping my options open. Um, why would I want to buy you know, guaranteed income, but actually I can imagine when I get to 75, 80 or whatever, yeah. I'd like it. You know, because yeah. I don't want to think about this so much now. So absolutely, I think annuities are a great deal um, in the right time and the right place for, for individuals. Um, it's just that right now, that word is toxic. Mm. It's a bit like with profits used mm. to be toxic or probably still is. Well, I don't know, I, I can't see with profits coming back as well in this new well, market. You know, you know, that, that idea of smoothing returns yep, yep, over the long term, if it's yep, done in a non-corrupt way, yep, would be rather wonderful. Yep. I, and, you know, the original concept around with profits was actually a perfectly reasonable one. I think it's just the, the marketing guys got hold of it and said, well, what we need is this and we want short of that and guaranteed this mm. and reversionary this. And, the, and then in the end, you kind of built a monster that fell over. Mm. Um, yeah, but but, I think but a, lot of, a lot of these old products really were the right thing. A split cap, a yeah. split cap investment trust, yeah. another absolute mm -hmm. classic. Divide, divide the return yeah. into capital for one lot of yeah. people, income for another lot yeah. of people. I mean, that yeah. that would also work marvelously in this post pension freedom environment. Well, I mean, back in back in the early eighties, I was in the stock market as a, a young fresh-faced um, blue button and learning all about split capital and investment trusts and, mm. and a lot of people used investment trusts mm. and uh, and I think absolutely you know very very appropriate for a lot of people but you know I, I, and that's what actually comes back to the point I don't think we need to be sort of designing ultra smart really complicated things I, I think we just need to listen to what people want and and I absolutely agree with your point about you know let's get over this thing about it just has to be income and somehow the sacred capital has to be locked away in a room not to be touched I think it, it you know there, there has to be some way of, of managing money which over over the period of when however long you live um, is actually going to give you a better return with giving you more options about how, what you want to do with your with your life and you know is that complicated I wouldn't have thought so and and, and as long as you can do it in a way that is sustainable that manages all these different asset classes in a way and yeah of course we're going to put up our hands and say we do this and so mm -hmm. we'd love to we'd love to have a chunk but you know it, it, it and and in a price sensitive way you know i do think that there's a market that will open up of people who who actually probably will be more discerning but they don't want to spend their entire retirement thinking about it you know so okay thank you very much indeed not at all thank you we've seen price falls in the housing market in the past in the early 90s and they went down 50 percent and i think that we're at the start of that kind of decline now as i think indeed fairly soon we will be at the start of that in the stock market as well.